My goodness, this is an entire adrenaline rush from start to finish. Julian, where did the idea for this one come from? Um, uh, okay, put me on the spot, right from the off. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, no, uh, really, uh, uh, when I finished <clears throat> uh, filming A Lonely Place to Die back in 2010 and doing the post-production, uh, you know, I wanted to sort of climb away from the UK and not just be climbing in Wales and Scotland. And that's when I first climbed in the Alps. And it was just, it was eye-opening to me. Not, not, only, not only the area, the place, the, the sheer scale of this place, but just the, the, the culture of, uh, of, 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 of Chamonix, of, of, of these places. And um, yeah, uh, I, I kind of just thought, you know, the inspiration was really, you know, how could I set a, set a film in this incredible world? And I was also, very briefly, very uh, sort of um, influenced by Joe Simpson's second book, which is a prequel to Touching the Void called This Game of Ghosts, when these bunch of 20 year olds in the early 1980s are working as Alpine bin men in Chamonix. And literally they're sleeping on friends' floors. They've got no money. They're getting drunk in bars, getting, you know, sleeping in tents and also doing this crazy climbing up on 4,000 meter peaks. And it's just this, yeah, I just thought it was, I just thought that was a really wonderful sort of stepping off point for the idea of, of this movie, you know? That was, that was, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> was, how involved were you then when it came to casting the movie? Um, well, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, at, the, at the beginning, we, you know, we just we just had a lot uh, of auditions. But what sort of seemed to happen was we we knew we had to shoot several small chunks of the film ahead of schedule due to weather and sort of safe periods on the mountain. Because you know, if you're going to film in a wood in England, you can film it 365 days a year. You know, depending on what you want. You know. Um, you know, if you're going to film on the Matterhorn or the Eiger, you've got a window of a couple of months towards the end of the summer here or with the Eiger much, much later in the year, sort of November time, or you want to be sort of March, April time. Uh, so, so we had to sort of have at least one cast member cast a little bit, well, what turned out to be significantly ahead of time. And then what happened was Freddie took to climbing like a duck to water. And so I just started, kept, I, I kept going back to the producers and going, look, um, I know it just says here we schedule it and we get Freddie in because, it, look, why don't we just get him to climb the Matterhorn? It's like, look, you're not going to get an actor to climb the Matterhorn. <laughs> I don't know, he's pretty good, you know? <laughs> and I just, I just, I just kept badgering. And then, of course, I was, you know, I obviously kept Freddie in the loop. I was suddenly take him up one of the most terrifying peaks in Switzerland. Uh, no, and so and Freddie, Freddie sort of took the physical challenge as seriously as of course, the acting challenge and everything else. And I think he wanted to give it that extra, extra something. And, and Freddie was willing to, you know, take, take, take risks. I don't mean that in a silly way. He was protected by very, very, very brilliant climbers, but Freddie was, yeah, bang up for just doing a, you know, going that bit further, you know? Freddie, was there something then about Michael or about the fact that you get to climb these iconic peaks? that really made you want to be a part of Summit Fever? Well, I don't think it necessarily worked like that for me, actually. It was, um, it was primarily uh, Julian's script that made me fall in love with the project. I think when I first signed on, it was about four years before we wrapped. And Julian and I had had a lot of conversations about the character and, and, and what we were going to, Try and achieve with the film and it only kind of transpired a few weeks after those conversations had been had that maybe I'd have a chance to do a lot of the climbing for real and I'm not one to shy away from adventure so I was quite excited to do that. <laughs> There's an interesting relationship uh, between Michael and um, and Indeed. Leo's characters. Mm. Did you and Ryan spend much time sort of trying to flesh that out or did Julian just really give you mostly insight about their relationship as well? Yeah well I think obviously Ryan was such an asset to our film and he came with such humility and grace 
and was just so good at the role that we did flesh out some of our relationship just because it it, it felt good. And I think Julian and, and, and Ryan spoke themselves before uh, Ryan even turned up on set and they, they kind of discussed, you know, maybe a bit more for the character. And then when I met Ryan, yeah, we'd go for a beer and we'd see where we landed on, on you know, who we were to each other. And hopefully that came across in the film. Uh, yeah, no, I'd also like to say that Ryan, you know, Ryan, he kind of totally got the fact that, you know, when you've got this, you know, this youngster from London coming out into this, you know, climbing mecca of the Alps and all the rest of it, you know, just because, you know, you know, some people might sort of say, oh, he's being unfair, he's being a dick, he's being mouthy, he's being this. It's like anybody starting their first day at work, you know, survive a few days of this and you get a wee bit more respect, you know, and, and yeah, you know, Ryan, Ryan kind of got that and he got that, you know, yeah, you know, he, he, he was very, um, and he was, you know, he was open to lots of sort of, he, he was able to just bring a, a, a lovely nuance to it as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, Julian, the cinematography on this is incredible. Did you discuss much about what you sort of expected from it or would like <laughs> to be able to get out of it in the end? Because, you know, of course, weather permitting and, and whatnot, but what kind of conversations then did you have with a cinematographer um, about what you'd like to see for Summit Fever? The drone shots are pretty epic. They are. I mean, you know, I, 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 I had the luxury of shooting a film in the mountains before in the highlands of Scotland um, uh, with A Lonely Place to Die. And that was kind of, that was really pre-drone, actually. So I was very au fait with helicopters and helicopters in the mountains. And, and, and the truth of the matter is you can do a hell of a lot more with a helicopter than you can do with a drone. You have a zoom lens, you're in there. You can adjust, you know, you, there's a lot more you can do than flying around with a fixed lens, going a lot slower, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is, is that, uh, you know, to, to begin with, Jamie, you, you, you write it out, you write the scene. And then in my case, you know, cause I, you know, uh, you know, I just start drawing it. I literally say, I just start storyboarding it and then ultimately you draw it all out and it's literally just becomes in again. Well, that's obviously an aerial shot. Could this and, and and the way I started initially drawing it out, I drew it out initially in that it was always a stunt double on the mountain, cut to a tighter shot of the actor. Uh, you know, not always, of course, but you know, but ultimately I then then again with Freddie's uh, physical abilities and, and and sort of keenness and you know wanting to do it, I was able to sort of change suddenly. I'm like, you know, wow, I don't need a close-up of this guy. Uh, you know, I, I can get a nice full kind of waist up shot of Freddie on the summit of the Matterhorn. You know, let's have a nice deep focus shot and see 50 miles into the distance. You know, so, so, so you adjust accordingly. But I mean, the truth is, I mean, the truth is, you know, whatever you film, whether it's, uh, you know, as, as Freddie's just talked about, you know, whether you film a love story in London, whether you film a, you know, a movie in the Alps, whatever it is, you can... Yeah, you just have to know, you know, you have to feel it, you have to draw it out. And then and then it's just, you know, it does become to some degree a, a, a technical plan, at least with the the more action orientated scenes, you know. Yeah, it becomes a sort of a, a tick them off. But um, yeah, we had some pretty crazy, uh, <laughs> crazy ways to film some of the stuff. But yeah, you know, it is one of those ones where we just said, keep ticking off my, my little pictures, you know. <laughs> Well, Freddie, this required a lot of training, a lot of trust also uh, on your part as well. Were there certain scenes in particular that had you nervous at all? Well, I think I'd have to be inhuman not to have felt nervous in some of the positions we were. But on the whole, I mean, we had some cool motherfuckers who were our, who are our guides and I think it, it, we we ultimately had a lot of trust in them and, and felt very safe. And they kind of took us on a journey and we started with things that were a little bit more accessible. And I think they felt out kind of my disposition at height and 
quickly realized I could get stuck in. I think the only one where I have to say I did probably lose my nerve a bit was the final sequence, which I, that is completely real. That is me on that wall. Um, and they, to make it, of course, I wasn't actually free soloing, but to make it easier to, to cheat that, they had my harness under my trousers so I couldn't see my own harness and I'm hanging on this whatever, how many meters is it, Julian? No, well, like, no, but yeah, I mean, well, you're on about a 12, 12 mil rope, and you know, that, that in which you no, basically how just many had coming through was your drop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, 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 to be honest, it wasn't about, it wasn't a big drop. It was only 300 meters, which is yeah, a thousand. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> it was a 300 meter drop, and I was dangling oh, there. God. Being low. It was so and, steep. <laughs> it was, that was pretty insane. But, um, and I'm, this is supposed to be when I'm looking cool and accomplished. and at that point, I didn't feel very cool and accomplished. Well, no, well. We got we got the scene, and um, yeah, no, it was an exciting day. I, I I I remember saying to Freddie as well. I said, once the digital effects artists have painted out that rope, I said, your mother's going to have a fit. Which she did. <laughs> I, I just, I, she's, I, I, no. she's now seen it, and you, I can indeed confirm she had a fit. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> That's my little boy. What's he doing yeah. on this clip? God, yeah. Yeah, 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 that was no, but um, yeah, no. He's it was, supposed uh, to be an actor. He's not I supposed know. to be. <laughs> it's all fake, mom. Yeah, um, yeah anyway, but you know, if you can that... get those shots, it's it. I'm always looking for if you can get those shots of the real uh, character. You know, the real actor, the real, the real, if you can get the shots of him in there, you know, do that as much as possible. Absolutely, you know. And I mean, you know, if they'd given us more money and a bit more time, <laughs> Freddie would have done more. So, you know, this was one of them, definitely, you know. Freddie, how did you then decompress after a long day of filming? Yeah, good point. I mean, to be honest, we were so whacked. Um, it's probably one of the few shoots that I've found it easy to decompress because by the time we got home, you kind of come back down to a lower alt altitude and altitude can be really knackering even in itself. But also we were working, I mean, probably 14 hour days, six days a week. I mean, it was heavy. And then right slap bang in the middle, we did our night shoot, which was completely nocturnal. I mean, when the sun went down, we started shooting. And when the sun came up, we stopped. Um, and that was bang in the middle of the shoot. And then we had to, uh, over the a weekend, turn it around to back to daytime shooting, getting up at five in the morning, doing the complete opposite. So it was safe to say that, uh, yeah, I, I did find it actually easier on this job than I have on any other just to get home and hit the hay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can sort of add in, I don't know about Freddie, but I, I always had a decompression with my first AD and we were, we were, you know, we just had a glass, a glass or sometimes two. <laughs> not really much beyond because by then you just, you, you do as Freddie quite rightly points out, you just absolutely crash down. But having said that, when you've been filming somebody in a, lightning storm at 5 a.m and all of this manic energy and then you've suddenly got to shut off yeah you just it's as as you're already saying a little bit of you know decompression freddie as he said was a very good boy and went straight to bed of course uh, no wine nah, you must have the old beer <laughs> no no wine i'm an ultimate consummate professional no wine or beer <laughs> freddie didn't have any i had the old glass of red wine but, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, you had to decompress after a long day, too. You had to make sure you got all of your shots in and as many as you could with the limited amount of time that you have with lighting, with, with scenery, without uh, putting anything at risk as well. So uh, I think both of you earned as whatever you drank and as much as whatever you drank <laughs> at that point. Oh, well, I mean, you know, the, the thing is, the thing is, it, it, it has to stop at two glasses because you have to be up again and do mm. it all over again. But what I did have was I did have a second unit and a third unit going, and I had the most incredible second unit director in John Shake. Uh, and again, you know, when we were doing the big sort of night, night sequences on the south face of Mont Blanc and what have you, uh, you know, as Freddie will, you know, back me up here, it, it came back down to the drawings and also certain images and stuff that we'd filmed, you know, in the years prior to it, you know, so we were able to sort of match all of this stuff up. So, mm -hmm. With me, you know, it was always a case of I know which shots I need to get to make the day. I will always drop some close-ups. I mean, you know, that's, you know, you, you can't be up at two thousand meters and worry about a close-up of a carabiner or whatever because you know that's going to be picked up by second or third unit. But you need the shot of Freddie 
with Mont Blanc behind or whatever, that's the important shot, not him clipping into something, you know. So, you know, in that respect, you know, we we very much prioritised what we needed to get. And, and yeah, it was, um, uh, yeah, so it, it was a well-oiled machine, I think, because we had, our, God knows how many years to oil it, you know. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Freddie, what do you personally take away from your time working on Summit Fever? Is it obviously uh, connections you've made? Is it a love of climbing? What do you personally take away? And what do you think it is about this movie that's just making it such a fast fan favorite thrill ride? Oh, well, thank you very much. That's very sweet. Um, look, I think this film is different to any film I've ever shot or TV show I've ever shot. Um, and Julian will vouch for that. Um, we were on it for such a long time and so much of it was actually just me and Julian. <laughs> um, up at altitude doing some wild things and over the course of uh you know four years I, we went out maybe six or seven times maybe five or six times um so ultimately actually on on this job what it meant to me is a, a collection of incredible experiences that i'll keep with me for the rest of my life and somewhere along the way a film got made <laughs> so i'm i'm very glad people like it but Right now, it's just a memory of the mountains. <laughs> yeah, I, think that's, I think that's beautifully articulate. It's, it's funny, though, because, you know, you have days where, you know, you're doing a, a house party and you've got 70, 80, 90, 100 extras and the lighting and blah, 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 and, you know, the background music and this, that and the other. And then we had this other completely different thing that, you know, Freddie and I, and Freddie's, you know, I screwed into a... 45 50 degree ice slope in Chamonix and we're three and a half thousand meters up and I'm sort of ice screwed next to him I don't know maybe 10 15 feet away with a little like sort of it's not a tripod because you can't set one of those up but I just had a spike do you remember it Freddie yeah. I just had like a spike at the bottom of the camera so I could just keep it sort of steady like yeah. that you know and, and it was literally it was like it was me with a, an admittedly bloody lovely camera and an amazing lens but that was that was it i mean literally it was a camera and it was freddie you know and maybe a double for jean pierre or what have you with some of the sort of the big sequences and it mm. was yeah it was just it just we we were able to sort of capture these really sort of intimate little moments uh you know when he was climbing uh you know and it, and it was all just just real and that that was a real thrill to me you know, mm. going shit, it's the actor. It's, you know, I don't have to cut to a, I don't have to turn around and cut to the actor, you know, you know, it, it was a really wonderful thing to be able to do. Mm. 